Uh, I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, we'll get started here in about a minute here. I'm just going to do a couple quick session reminders for everybody. And then um, Ryan will lead us through our discussion today. Uh, so let me just share my screen here real quick with a couple of reminders that I have. So let's just see. Okay. Uh, can everybody see just my quick reminders for the session? Yep. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Um, obviously, camera is optional during the session, so uh, it is encouraged, but obviously we want to make sure that we're respecting everybody's privacy. So um, it is encouraged, but obviously, if you want to, we want to respect your privacy. So if you want to remain um, on privacy mode, that's great. Uh, the other thing is, is if the other thing that I want to mention, too, is if we need to slow down and discuss at any time, just let the speaker know. Uh, it's most likely that if you have a question, someone's going to have the same question, or there's going to be somebody in the group who's going to be um, great at explaining a specific topic. So if there's anything that pops up that uh, people are unfamiliar with or have a question of, definitely jump in. The other thing is, the next thing I want to mention is, is that none of us is as smart as all of us. Um, us collectively are smarter than anybody, any one individual in this group. And so uh, take this opportunity to have discussions, take this opportunity to ask questions, and take this opportunity to, um, you know, to say, I don't know, because that's a good thing. If you don't know something, this is the time to definitely have a conversation to, for us all to learn from each other. The other thing I want to mention, too, is as we start digging into the book, there's going to be some more chapter exercises that are available. So I encourage everybody to at least attempt the chapter exercises. If there, if you have issues or you can't answer a question, there is a solutions guide available. I don't know if I mentioned this in my chapter one material, but there is a solutions guide that you can access that will give um, a pretty good detailed rundown of all the information that you might need for each question in each chapter. So that's a great resource if you get stuck and I've definitely got stuck on a question for this week. So, but I encourage everybody to do that. And then the last thing before I transition over to Ryan tonight is um, I encourage everybody in the group to at least teach one lesson uh, from the uh, book chapters. If you're interested in seeing what chapters are still available, you can access this in the Slack group. Uh, we've already have a couple sessions already spoken for, but if you're interested in seeing what sessions are coming up or potentially seeing ones that you might be interested in, this is the sign up sheet for it. And I encourage everybody to at least take on one, if not two. Um, teaching it is a great way to learn it. So other than that, that's all I really have for session reminders. Uh, Ryan is going to lead us through chapter two tonight. And so, Ryan, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. OK, um, so I. Can everybody see? Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so basically what I was trying to do is paste this thing. This is gonna be a lot um easier in my head but somehow okay so all right so i just did like a, a markdown thing a quarto thing just to, to um kind of reiterate some stuff and then um i'll be kind of going back and forth um there we go i shouldn't even leave that um okay so um this whole chapter is about names and values and um you know the the, the kind of to summarize some of the main things that the, the chapter is about is to more accurately predict performance and memory use, which, you know, a huge part of what this whole book is about is like, how can we use our computer resources, um, the most efficient way, fastest way, whatever. Uh, avoid ac accidental copies. We're going to learn about that and then learn more about sort of the functional programming tools. Um, this, um, chapter reminds me of like a series of quotes that I'm sure, well, some of you are probably familiar with, um, so John uh, M. Chalmers, Ch Chambers is, um, uh, he created S, 
the S language, which is what R is based on, and obviously we know who Hadley is. Um, so I let, this is sort of, uh, this is from a, uh, this is not my characterization, but from a great, um, blog. Uh, the three noble or deep truths about R, everything in R is an object, everything that happens in R is the result of a function call. Names have objects, objects don't have names. So this, you know, this last one in particular is, is relevant for us, right? I think our tendency would be to think about objects having labels or names, but in fact, um, our, our author is um, sort of trying to tell us to think otherwise. So uh, anyway, check out this, this um, blog post if you get a chance. Um, I'll put it in the, uh, the chat, actually. Okay. Um, anyway, so I don't know if people want to go through this, but there, uh, you know, some of the questions I, you know, I, I put into my output, but it's not to go into the chapter, but so, um, you know, just, you know, before we even get into the chapter, they said, you know, can you answer these questions? If so, then maybe you can skip this. Um, these are the three, the three um, questions. Given the following data frame, how uh, do I create a column named three that contains the sum of one and two. Um, you can't use the, the pound sign or the, the dollar sign. You can't use double brackets. What makes um, one, two, and three challenging is, is um, variable names. Uh, anybody want to take a quick shot at that? It's the fact that they're also used as indexes, right? Right, yeah. So they have multiple. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're already sort of. Uh, I guess numbers aren't like we wouldn't call them um, reserves, but in the, in the same way that other words would be. But yeah, they obviously have different reference. Um, I also think it's too like you have to surround them right in back text, right? Because like right. they're right. they're not syntactic, but if you put obviously put them in back text, that then you can use it. But that also makes it kind of like more like clunky. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To like select. Sure, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, how to how much memory does this uh, does Y occupy? Well, there's we learn, you know, through the lobster um, package and uh, you know, and other ways of doing this. So I don't think we have to kind of do this. One. Okay, um, on which line does a cop um, does A get copied in the follow example? So uh, I didn't really, yeah. So. Um, I didn't really understand this question. Did anybody else on which line does A get copied in the following example? So I mean, I guess I guess it's just that. I mean, is that what they're talking about? I mean, I, I, I guess. So I think in the rest of the chapter, it talks about how uh, code gets or um, the values get copied on modify, right? Mm. Oh, so it's actually that third line. It, okay, right, because you're right, because um there's no need to even make a copy because a and b are the same good, good, yeah. good catch yeah um so yeah so this is sort of um they have i didn't i only copied this particular little graph um for this uh you know, chapter but you know the idea being the arrow is pointing at the the things right we have three numbers and x is, is the name of it so the name is yeah, I'm still, I don't know about the rest of you, I'm still kind of like wondering why I have to think of names having objects and not, uh, uh, did anyone kind of come away with why this is important? I had a thought, if you want yeah. to. Yeah. You know, uh, basically what you just were talking about, this copy on modify thing, right? So the name yeah. will change what object it's pointed to. Um, in that case, originally it pointed to the same object as the, as uh, I forgot the letters were, but let's say it's A and B, right? So B pointed to the same object that A pointed to, but then when you modified it with B, you make a new object that's a copy, and now B now points to something different. So uh, I guess that's why to think of it that way, but it's, yeah, the, and also many names can point to the same object as well. Is what we're learning. Oh, right? yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, so yeah, okay. No, I like that. Um, okay, so anyway, there was a series of um, sections. I mean, I'll go through these um, relatively quickly. Yeah, so they do mention, uh, to, to Ron's point, one of the ways that you can um, sort of detect, you know, what, what, you know, where the object is coming from. Is it a new object or a copy? Is 
this OBJ um, uh, underscore address. Um, and um, oh, I was trying to figure out what lobsters have to do with anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you're familiar with this. You're, you're familiar with what this is, right? So yeah. In R, you can put a double um, colon and then you don't have to load. The yeah. Actually, actually, I don't even know why I did that because I already loaded it. But um, anyway, I think I just copied it from the book. Um, right. So this is one way they, they show us that, you know, by looking at the the ID of the object, you can tell if it's like a new object or if it's just you know, a copy of the previous one. They also talk about this idea of a syntactic name, which you know obviously can, can you know can consist of letters, digits, and uh, periods and underscores. I don't know about you guys, but like in my experience, like people are either period or underscore people. Have you noticed this? I don't know. Like I have a I had a colleague who only likes to use periods, and I only like to use underscores. So. It's kind of silly, but um, yeah. I only ever used underscores. And so when I first saw people putting periods in names, I thought they were like, I thought yeah. it was like Python where they yeah. were calling other Same functions. exact problem I had. Yep. That's yeah. why I definitely will not be using periods. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there are actually, there is, a, there's a, I forget if it was the tidyverse or one of the, the sort of the, 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 the coding standards. They mentioned something like a, a good practice would be. For fat, like for uh, for function uh, names or function calls, using like you know periods or um, or underscore, and then the opposite for you know objects that are you know like data or whatever. And so that might be, that's a good way to kind of help. I've been trying to think about that, like when I when I create functions, like to use periods instead of because I like to use underscores for you know data frames and stuff like that. But anyway, something to think about. Um, Oh yeah, and then um, you can't begin with a period or underscore or a digit. Um, and then they also talk about the re the reserved words, which are if else repeat. Well, you know, we're all sort of familiar with this. So you can't name an object or um, another function. Um, these things probably a good idea um, to avoid that. Um, but yeah, then and then I think uh, Robert, you were. You said as much, right? So if we put these little, um, actually, what do you guys refer to these two? These are not like, what, what's, uh, I forget what the, the actual. I think they're called back ticks. Back ticks. Thank you. Yeah. So you can't just use like single, uh, quotes or double quotes. You have to use these to reference a, an object that is non syntactic, right? Um, yeah. And so, Oh, this is an, I, I like this. This is an interesting question. Um, those of us who work with like messy data probably can appreciate this. Does anyone have a, an answer to this? Like, um, so, um, if there's non syntactic names in the data, it will make them syntactic. But why might this be a problem? So it's a problem depending on. Uh, what you're expecting, right? If you're expecting the names to be a specific thing, but then R changes them, um, yeah, that can be a problem. Right. Um, anybody else have any other comments about um, why why this might be problematic? I mean, I think you know, obviously, you pretty much nailed it. Um, anyone use the janitor package by any chance? I no. haven't. Uh -uh. Yeah. I want to check it out because um, there is this like clean underscore name function that will will do it and it will do it in a way that typically is um, well I don't know like I it, it makes everything lowercase like one of the things I can't stand is and even though I tell people at work this all the time like please don't capitalize variable names don't put any spaces and sometimes we still get those things so what, one of the things it will do is well, typically, I think by by default, it will use underscores as like a separated. You can maybe change it to periods if you want or whatever. But yeah, so you definitely want to be um, uh, explicit in, in what you think, because otherwise, um, and I've actually had this happen where like different importing functions like, will change slightly, and so the output of what I get is different, so that I get all these other errors thrown. So. Yeah, you always want to be explicit in what you're expecting. Um, what option is it that suppresses the behavior? Does anyone? What's that? 
that second question where you oh. have highlighted? I was just wondering if anyone knew, because I don't. It okay. is, um, I did this. Let's see what number. I looked it up too, but I forgot what, it, what the answer was. It's like, it's, a, it's not set names or it's like make dot names or something. I can't remember the exact. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, so the janitor package is, um, let's see. Yeah, let me just uh, show you this real quick. Like, um, so you can like the check dot names argument that will like check if it's syntactic. You can set that to false. That's a boolean true or false. Um, which will automatically append X. I think it's I think it's the check dot names function. I think is the one that will at least check if it's syntactic, and if it's not, it will modify it based on its specific rules that it has. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. The base, the base way. I don't know if you all can, can you all see my screen that I, I found. This is um, yeah. Okay, so this is for the the janitor package, right? And so you can do a lot of cool things like compare uh, columns and and you can do these cool little tables and look for duplicates and stuff. But the base our way of making you know to changing you know to showing or changing the names is make dot names, right? And so you're, that's a good show. But, but right. when you do this, when you do this, um, you know, this is just an empty function call. It will uh, see how it goes from this is what it would look like otherwise. So it's you know the first you know name, and now it's, it looks better to me. Getting rid of period, repeated periods. So I don't know. Like this, you know, this is what the book specifies. But I like Janitor better. But anyway, that's just you know. My bad. So um, in the the third um, section or you know subsection or whatever they talk about, and, and Ron, you mentioned this idea of you know, copy on modify. Um, some of these are like I'm taking direct quotes because some of these I had a hard time sort of relating to, or like you know it's a different way of talking. So um, I want to make sure everyone else can understand. A, um, a related way to describe this behavior to say is that. Um, our objects are unchangeable or immutable. However, I'll generally avoid that term because there are a couple of important exceptions to copy on uh, modify that you'll learn in um, section 2.5, which you learn about in, in environments and and um, the single uh, reference um, issue. So, when exploring copy on modify, interactively be aware that you'll get different results. And, uh, did did anyone else have a problem with this? Uh, this was probably one of the most confusing things. I don't know what. So that's because the environment panel must be must make a reference to each object in order to display the information about this distorts your interactive exploration so this doesn't affect code inside of functions. I don't really I'm not fully grasping this. Does anyone else? It, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say it just it just means that the uh, the environment's got an extra uh an extra point or two, whatever object you're looking at, so it'll always treat as if you've already defined two variables instead of just one. So in some oh. cases where it wouldn't make a copy, it will. Like if you define a variable and then immediately redefine it, uh, it shouldn't make a copy. But then if you because the environment's there, it will make a copy. That type hmm. of thing. Yeah. Anybody else? So in the, some of the examples they give don't work the way it advertised in in, ter in the uh, R Studio, but they do work fine on the command line. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Or they'll they'll work. Oh, they work. They work as you as they show in the example. There's nothing wrong. Nothing's broken. It's perfectly yeah. fine. Um, the reason for this behavior is simply to make it more easier to work with R, so you don't have to worry about these things. So we're worrying about them because we're trying to learn about them. But normally, the way they're done is in such a way that it should be transparent. Sure, sure. Um, when okay. you do a trace memory, you can actually. See. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the trace mem is a way for us to kind of look at um, you know the history of an object to see if it's you know gets the same ID or I like this I, this, I, this is totally new for me right that this idea of you know like giving us this history of okay we came from this now we added something yeah, so cool. we something new there and then you have to make sure that you always turn it off otherwise you'll. Yeah. Is someone talking? I, I, I feel like what, I'm not sure who I can hear, but all right. Um, 
I think we might have some feedback. Yeah, I think oh, we just have a little bit of feedback. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, probably me. I'll try to make sure I'm muted. I'm, I'm not. I don't have my headphones on, so no I'll make sure I'm muted. Um. So then they talk about data frames, and then I, which I kind of left out just because you know it's, it's sort of obvious that you know each column is like you know a you know thing that can be made reference to, and so you could have you know multiple data frames with the same columns um, that are identical. Uh, they also talk about um, you know a list being a particularly um, I guess the, the word would be like um, computationally less expensive because they can do this thing called shallow copying. So so we have we start off with a list, um, we make a copy of it and then we add something we, or we change something in the in the copy of the list. Um, so apparently, um, the, the, this L2 is a shallow copy where the list object and its bindings are copied, but the values pointed to by the bindings are not. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still kind of wrestling with that a little bit. Um, they did talk about, like, this, you know, they did provide this example where we had, um, obviously, Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this would be from the original. And then we, we see here we have the same um, uh, pieces underneath, but the actual name of the, the, the overarching list, list is different because we made those changes. And in fact, the changes do show up in the final element. Um, and the last thing, I thought this was pretty interesting, right? So, and this is, yeah, I think I, I did learn this at some point. So whenever you have a, a string, um, a, a vector of, of strings, uh, R makes like this sort of general pool of strings and then references each of them by some kind of ID, um, so that you don't have to like hold, you know, each instance of a particular string in memory. It's just this reference. It's, Away, so you can see there's a lot kind of less computationally expensive. We have just the same reference to A, and you know, each of these only turn up one. So, and then um, section four was about object size. Um, I mean, I think all of us have thought about this, um, especially if you're working with bigger data. Um, they do the they they give you the size of you know, what it would take to hold all letters in um, the English language and memory, it's not that much. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this idea of al alternative uh, um, representation, I think, is this idea of this, you know, you know pointing to these, these global pools of strings. And so, and they, well, excuse me, they also no, they talk about alternative representation as, only holding the first and last um, object in memory because you don't you don't need to hold all of them. You just need to know that it's everything you know between those two inclusive. And so that's why even though these are different numbers, we get the same object size. Um, yeah. So then we talked um, about these special exemptions of you know um, of um, well we talked about copy on modify. And so uh, there are these um, a couple of important exceptions to copy and modify that we learned in, in 2.5. Um, so objects with a single binding get a um, special performance optimization. So um, if, if an object has a single name bound to it, it will just modify in place, which kind of makes sense. What's, what's the point of making it more complicated? Um, yeah, and so um, two complications make predicting exactly when R applies this optimization is challenging. So yeah, I, I, this was sort of complex, right? So when it comes to bindings, it can only count zero, one, or many. That means if an object has two bindings and one goes away, the reference count does not go back to one. Yeah, that seems counterintuitive to me, right? One less than many is still many. So um, I guess, you know, once you have more than one, you're sort of, you're stuck. Um, or you have the potential for making um, needless copies. Um, 
And then also, whenever you call the vast majority of functions, it makes um, a reference to the object. The only exception is when you're using primitive C functions. So, yeah, that's the kind of stuff we're going to be learning. So I can't really say much more about that right now. So, um, yeah, so this they, they just talk about this idea of, you know, what, you know, when we, we might have issues right like when there's complications with how you're going to optimize this sort of binding of, of an object to a name and they, they talk about environments which of course you know um yeah they're, they're, this is something where we can you know sort of modify it in place and um they as they show in the in the book um this idea of you know you change uh one of the elements in the in in one of the um the lists and it, it changes it it remembers it so to speak in the um in the other one so and then lastly they talk about this idea of the garbage collector which i don't know like when i i, I haven't done this in a long time but i used to use the you know the gc function a lot to clean my memory out but yeah apparently they're saying you don't need to do that it does it already and um yeah, it does it anytime you need memory to create a new object. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all I, I had. Um, I was thinking we could, um, we can go through some of the other, um, I mean, this isn't really like a, oh, okay, yeah, so this was, um, Explain the relationship between A, B, C, and D in the following code. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it's pretty. Um, actually, let me. I'm not going to say anything else. What's what's the, what's the issue here with this code? I mean, why well, it's we created an integer vector. Oh wait, my oh, yeah, good. Uh, we created an integer vector, right? One through ten. We then that gets bound to then a. Then we mm -hmm. then we bind a to a name b, which means we're pointing to the same object in memory. Then we go <laughs> b. We're binding to a now a name called c. Now all three of those are are now pointing to the same object in memory. Mm -hmm. But d is different because even though we have the same integer vector, it's a different uh, yeah. one in memory. So right. it's just it's like weird, but yeah, that, that's um. <laughs> What, so if I was to get the object, there. if I was to get the object ID, all of three of these would be the same, but this would be a different number, right? Correct. Or a different yep. ID, excuse me. Um, yeah, this was interesting, actually. Um, what do you all think about this? Well, I just want to confirm with everybody that they got the same object address yeah, for I all of too. these based on the function. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I went a little bit, uh, I went with, I went a step further with this and I was interested to see, okay, if this was true, then you would be able to pass this through like a map function. And I don't know how many people are, are familiar yeah. with per map functions, but when I did that, I got a different object address for all of them. So basically what I did is I, you know, I referenced all of these objects, right? So I saved like base mean as an object or mm. I assigned a value to the object, assigned a value to this. And then what I did is I created a vector of all those okay. references, ran it through a map function, just checking what the object address was, and it was all different. Mm. So I didn't know, I mean, I could, I could pop up the example that I put together when I was playing around with it, but I was gonna put a, a question in the Slack because I didn't know why. And I was wondering if, if, if this goes back to your like shallow list idea that I was talking mm. about, maybe. I don't, that, when you were talking about it, I was like, oh, this might be related to the shallow I'll, list. Well, shallow, but this, we're not talking about a list, we're talking about a function though, but I don't, yeah, no, I, I hear you. That's, um, yeah, that's an interesting, I, I, I wonder if you're yeah. actually getting the address of the list elements, which in, you, if you follow those through the next level, that would be the, where the function actually is. Well, that's what I was wondering, uh, or I was the thinking. cell addresses. Yeah, either that, or I was thinking it was like maybe map, like when you put when you put that that vector of values through the map mm -hmm. function, I wonder if it converts it to a list object, and because it converts it to a list object to iterate mm -hmm. over, it might create a new object address for each one. I don't know. It was really it was something. It was not what I would expect. It gave me like a wet kind of feeling. I was like, what? <laughs> like 
this doesn't make sense. So well, you should um, post it anyway. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind playing with it later. Yeah, so you post I'd love it to in see Slack it. or something. I mean, maybe I messed something up, but oh, I was looking at it and now. I was just like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could share it with with y'all right now if you want to look at it. So I would be um, looking at it. Sure. Let me uh, make sure I'm not sharing oh. anything. That you're good. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my console example. So this is going to look a little bit different from our studio, but it's going to be the same. It's going to look almost the same. So uh, let me show this desktop two. Okay, so here's the exercise that I had, right? And you can see the mm -hmm. output on the bottom. So here's the bottom, right? Just bring it in per, bring in a lobster or a lobster. You know, here's the object address for X, right? I assign mm -hmm. a value X to mean, base mean, you know, get mean, same thing, checking the address, the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. But then when I take all those object references and put it in their own vector and then pa pass it through a map character function, all oh, the addresses man. get different. And I don't know why this one, this was one of those moments where I was like, uh, this doesn't make sense. So I don't know if this is partly because I'm working in the context of a map function or if it's something completely different, really just, it was one of those like lap moments that I was just like, I don't know what's going on here. So that's so, super interesting. So if anybody wants, if anybody knows what's going on here, like would love to know a little bit more yeah, and we might yeah. learn about yeah, this I wonder as if we it, get like you said, go ahead ron i'm just wondering like, if you do you have that running what if you just look did functions you know subscript one uh, and pass that to object address right like you get the same like object address and then just do funks yeah one something like this yeah we get the same one oh, I do. before yeah so it's yeah so you i think you're probably right because map returns a list it says map returns a list so i wonder if it turns into a list first <laughs> which might explain yeah. what those things are where can you make that can we make that can we save the variable output from map chr and then do that what do they do in the book to to show that tree diagram uh, uh ref no, I... ref yeah it's ref so maybe do REF, yeah, ABC. Right. It's character yeah. vector. Oh, that didn't help. Well, it's character much. vector because I oh, use okay. the, the prefix character, so it outputs a character right. vector. Oh, right. So we've already lost, yeah, we've lost the information. Those are just characters, right? I mean, I could, I could just, do this. What if we just put identity in there? Oh, what you, I was just going to say, what if you, instead of passing object ADR, you just pass like an identity function. I mean, here's what we get if we do the reference. So like if I, I changed it to the output to be a list yeah. now. And so here's the object addresses, all of them. But it's still it characters. Like it's still characters. I, oh. I have no idea. Yeah. Those, oh, go ahead, Ron. Yeah. No, never mind. I thought I had an idea, but I lost it. I think you're right. I think what's happening though is it funks the vector is being turned to a list and object address is actually, oh, well, you could try that. You could try, turning funks into a list first yourself manually and then just see what the object address that it might it'll be different right yeah so look at list and then do a ref on funks ref on funks oh now it's all the same so there must be something with the map functions that oh well, wait a minute is this yeah, what i, I expected that. that's a mystery to me no, i i'm gonna post it i'm gonna different. post it in slack <laughs> Because I was sitting there, I was like, oh, it's a I'm mystery. I'm going to be cheeky. And I'm like, I, I bet if I get this all, the, I'll put it to the, confirm that these are all the same. And then it came back and it was all different object addresses. And I was just like, I don't know why this is the case. So it might be something with like how map, how the map functions do it. But yeah, this one was a mystery to me. So weird. Huh. Yeah. So I'm going to post that in the Slack and hopefully we get an answer to it because that one just kind of threw me for a loop. Yeah, it's like anyway, now, sir. make a copy. Sorry about that. No, you're good. I just, I, w I went off on a little tangent there. It was beyond what the question asked, but I was just interested. I wonder if, if you use the base R, what is it called? Apply or something like that? Yeah. That's what I was wondering, but I just don't know the apply functions well enough to. Me either. <laughs> yeah. 
once you get into once once you I, that's the funny thing about a lot of my learning. I'm sure you guys can relate to this is because the tidyverse was already so robust by the time I was ready to to learn some things. I just I'm not as good at like doing loops and stuff. I don't know about you, but I'm just like. Um, well, that's in this book somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So only in R is doing loops considered advanced. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you know like, like, doing like, you know, um, but uh, yeah. So, okay. So, oh yeah. Um, what rules does make that names i will tell you this that like yeah it'll it'll erase repeated um periods and underscores it'll move um or it'll remove numbers at the start or other you know weird symbols um so yeah uh other than that let me see like i think i was gonna go over some of the other exercises oh um Oh, yeah, I thought this was sort of interesting, right? Why is uh, trace mem uh, 1 through 10 not, um, I didn't actually try this. I wanted to see. Why is this, so I, this is, can, can you all, you all can see, hopefully. I've um, put it in my console. I mean, uh, you're not giving it a, you're not giving it a reference. I mean, why would you, yeah. like, you're not giving it a reference. So that reference can't change or that object can't change. Well, it is an object that gets stored, but you don't have a reference to that object, so it would just. It's, Can everyone see that? Every time you do it, it's like a new ID. It's kind of cool. Um, I hadn't even thought about that. Um, so, yeah, I guess that, that's pretty much all I really wanted to cover. Um, what, uh, yeah, what else? Anybody else have any? other thoughts or oh you know we we never really met lance actually maybe uh lance everyone else has introduced themselves maybe you can um um say a few words i don't know about like what your background is and... yeah sure um so um education background um i actually graduated in chemical engineering wow um and then when COVID hit um i have i have two boys that are uh, both autistic mm. um and so when COVID hit and school shut down um mm. my wife had more help at home and stuff and so quit my job um and i was actually luckily be uh, was able to find an at-home remote position um doing some data analysis stuff so that's what i've kind of been doing since then wow so um were you using r as a as a um as a chemist or a, um chemical sorry chemical in, in, as a chemical engineering you said no so um most everything i did as a chemical engineer was actually um either in excel um actually yeah most of it was excel hmm. um but i always have kind of had like a, the fascination with um r just because um i mean you can do so much more in r than <laughs> excel sure. um, and in school i was introduced to python um but I, I always hated python and hmm. i always just felt like it was uh, more of a computer programming language instead of um how would you describe that instead of like an operational like i want you to do this and um type of analysis kind of thing i felt like i felt like r was just much better um at doing things hmm. in python but maybe that's just my experience <laughs> yeah sometimes different people so what kinds of things are you doing with r now like are you using it for work or yeah so um right now i use r to um access apis so i use okay. the um hitter package a lot to okay. access APIs and then um in my free time I've kind of been playing around with um topic modeling and creating shiny apps oh wow that, kind of thing. So, that sounds very cool 
Yeah. And Rob, Robert, uh, well, Ron and I know Robert, but um, Robert is a newbie for this group at least. Maybe you can um, give a couple. Yeah. Um, so Robert, I, it was in a, another book club with uh, Ron and uh, Ryan or baseball's book club finished it up this Wednesday. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I figured I'd join this group. Um, well, I guess my background. So I graduated uh, school back in 2020. I was a poli sci major. Um, so yeah, I gra graduated during COVID, which was just lovely. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I, I really got into programming more in my what sophomore year undergrad. Uh, you know, I got introduced to R. I had like tried to program two other times in my life. One was in Java. So I was a kid, I wanted to make Minecraft plugins and that, that failed really poorly. Um, and then I try to code in Python again, like freshman year, but I didn't really have like a use case for it. Um, it didn't really like click with me. I mean, now, now in my work, I use Python pretty much all, all the time. Um, but at the time, like I didn't really get Python, but yeah. So, I mean, I, I work as a data analyst at this uh, tech company called basis tech. We just sell an enterprise NLP product to, um, commercial and government clients. I don't do the, that. I work on the sales operations team. So it's a lot more, you know, like internal, you know, working with like internal business related data. Um, so yeah, you know, that's what I, what I do for my, my day job, but I figured I'd join this um, mostly because like I, so like I work, my, my manager knows, he, he writes in Python for, for better or worse. And like, I've gotten like pretty good at Python. Um, I can actually like use pandas and be productive, <laughs> um, which is, uh, a few months ago, it was, it was not great. I was like yelling at my computer a lot. Um, so I figured that since I haven't really been writing a lot in R, I figured this would be like a good time just to engage with R, I think, as a programming language. I think a lot of people who, I, I mean, I'm only really can talk my own experience. Like when I first started with R, it was because I wanted to do like a thing. For me, that was more of like an interest, interest in like politics. I wanted to like play around with some political data. And R is like obviously like very good for data analysis, but there doesn't really require, I would say, like a ton of upfront like thought about like what's a vector, what's a list, what are what so they could really a data frame is like under the hood. Um, so I figured it would just be a good time just to, since I'm not really using it really a ton at work, uh, just to kind of for fun, just to experience like R just as like as a language more more so than just like a tool uh, for data analysis and just try to understand it better and you know see what I can learn. Cool. Well, excellent. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. I was. I mean, I don't. Um, I don't have anything else. Um, but what about the rest of y'all? No, I just want to say um, welcome to both Lance and, and Robert. I'm, I'm glad the group is growing. Um, I want to see if we can get this group as as big as we can. So, um, you know, I kind of. Uh, gave a little introdu introduction of myself. Uh, I am tradition. I am traditionally an analyst. I'm not a data scientist. Uh, I'm I'm an analyst. I work for a public media station, uh, basically doing a lot of like web analytics, um, customer analytics, uh, just mostly on the business side of things. So, uh, been using R for I think I think seven to eight years now. Uh, been really comfortable with the tidyverse modeling stuff and then you know visualization it just got to a point where I need to like learn how R actually works I've always been briefly like around the edges like maybe reading a chapter here and there from our advanced R and then um, it's just finally to the point where it's like I, I have to if I want to advance in this I got to get a better understanding of how it works so um, yeah just want to say welcome both to Lance and and Robert for joining in. So appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, does any, I guess, does anybody else have any other like questions or exercises that um, like trip them up or that they want to discuss a little bit further? I mean, yeah, obviously the question that you raised with the, the, the math thing, that's the most interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to probably post that to the Slack. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder if we're going to get to that again somewhere later on in the book because it's going to talk about functional programming a little bit more. Um, I thought another one that was kind of interesting was... Does it, I wonder if it has anything to do with... So I did try... By Does the it have anything to do with C? I don't think... Like it, the, it may have nothing to do with any of that. It might just be just something to do with when you turn something into a list because like I did try like just taking the list 
taking the three functions or just two actually, actually just one function and just copying it four times into a list, right? And then turn into an array and then turning to a list and all the elements change the addresses. Um, so without calling anything. So I think that there's a copy being made somewhere. Maybe it's something more fundamental that I'm just missing. <laughs> So it must be some like copy on modify happening in the background. Like yeah. with map That's it. or there's it. Just turning it. So first thing the map does is turn into a list. I did check the code. It does do that. So that's the turning into a list is where the problem or problem or whatever. It's not really a problem. Of course, again, it's only a problem. You looking to see how things it's fine. It works fine. But you open it up the, like we're doing, we're opening up the, uh, taking the screws off and taking the back off, looking around, poking around. <laughs> we're going to find things are kind of funny. <laughs> But yeah, I, worth posting in. Yeah, I, I'm just like, I'm just skipping ahead, just like chapter nine when they're on, which is like, I think that's, <laughs> I have tried to read this book multiple times and I've always ended up at chapter nine and then always burnt out. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I'm just like looking at like a, I was posting the Zoom. I don't know if it's is maybe related, but um, like, so you have to, there's, right, like a new vector that then you're like appending everything to, right? Like if you apply some function, right, there's some data structure and then you're saving out there, maybe? Like I also, mm -hmm. we could just pr probably try that out. I don't know, <laughs> but I think it's a very, it's interesting. Yeah, it's just interesting to know because I mean, I think, you know, I wonder if, you know, a part of me thinks like with like the iteration portion of it, you know, a lot of people don't like you know, for loops or, or while loops and R because of the, uh, how many copies it actually makes. Um, so I'm wondering if it's the same thing with map, if it does something similar with like the, with the data that you have, if it's making copies to which could slow it down. And I mean, I'm just like, I'm shooting from the hip right now. Like, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah, so I'm just like know. popping ideas out. So yeah, that was one that was interesting that I thought the other one that I thought was kind of interesting too, was like two section two, five, three, like the first exercise, the one where it was like, explain why the following code doesn't create a circular list. And it was kind of interesting that it's, it's the copy on modify that's preventing the creation of that circular list. And I thought that was kind of interesting yeah. that like that copy on modify is like a concept that's used in R to help protect you or to help you help protect you from doing like certain things. So it's not necessarily like a bad thing. So it's just kind no, of- It's kind of like part see. of the lazy, yeah, the lazy philosophy, like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like if you thought of it was always making a copy all the time, you would get logically the same answer. So what it's doing is just holding off, lazily making a copy until it absolutely has to make a copy to maintain the illusion of always making a copy. It's the way I like to think about, right? Hmm. In other languages, there's other languages that do this as well. Um, well actually, mo many functional languages have this kind of way of doing things. So secretly, secretly maintaining one copy when you you, you know you think you're making a million copies, and um, yeah, like well, I said, it does it all the time. Environments, environments don't do that, but something else I forgot about. Yeah, it's just that like on the underlying concept of like things like what's immutable and what's not immutable is kind of interesting to also like follow too, like. And it's kind of interesting that like R kind of has that there's some areas where things are immutable and they're not like, and I know like my very base, like understanding of, of Python is not as strong as it probably should be. I'm still learning it, but like, you know, there's certain like data structures or built-in data structures into Python right. that are completely yeah. immutable. You can't change them. Yeah, and so, tuples, for example. Right. Yeah, 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 tuples. And then I'm like, I'm looking at that. I'm like, is there anything in R that has that? And it's like, uh, not that I've noticed from reading at least this chapter and then a little bit of the chapter number three. And so it's just kind of interesting to, th to think that R kind of has that flexibility in it, you know, flexibility enough to shoot yourself in the foot, but also some flexibility that's also good too as well. And so I think that's just kind of interesting um, from reading about that. Well, in some, in some ways, like it says, everything appears immutable in R. It just, <coughs> right? Well, I mean, you could, you, I think you can, I think some of the reserved words you can, you can change. I think you can add a different reference to it. So I think well, but you you're not, see again, you're not changing, you're not, you're changing what the name points to, but the object is still there. <laughs> Immutable. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> yep. No, you're right. You're exactly right. 
<laughs> so you're just changing the name. You're not necessarily changing the object. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. So yeah, if you want to do that with the reserved word, you sure could. I don't know why you would, but you can. So. <laughs> just to drive people crazy. <laughs> I'm going to change my values of true to false. <laughs> um, to drive your grad students crazy. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any other ones that I found were kind of interesting as well. Does anybody use matrix matrices? Like I just, I never use matrices. And so not in R. Yeah. I mean, I do for like, you know, I have a lot of projects where I need to run a lot of like item level correlations. So I definitely, yeah, more, more in Python for me. Okay, more good. In, more in Mathematica for me. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing hardcore linear algebra. I reach for that I do it most of the time. But, but a Python as well. Yeah. Numpy. That's like, that's so way outside of my, like, my, 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 what I do today today. So it's like when I started reading about some of the matrix stuff, I was like, eh, this is going to get rough for me to go through. Um, I don't think it's a key part of the book. Yeah. I was thankful because I was like, I'm going to struggle through those parts. I think environments too are interesting. Um, yeah. I, I can't wait to, I can't wait to kind of dig into that a little bit more because I don't use environments as much, but I think with the environments, it's going to come up again when we start talking about like, when we start getting to OOP, especially with like S3, R6 and S4, I think this is probably going to come up more and it's going to be interesting to see how these data structures like are used in that kind of context. So. Sure. Unless anybody else has anything else that they want to add, um, we're getting mm -hmm. close to the hour here. So, no, I think uh, Ryan did a good job on uh, covering the chapter, and we're ready to move on to the vectors. Yeah, excellent. Oh, All right, wow. cool. Well. All right, cool. Well, I, I want to just say thanks again to Ryan for taking on uh, the, the speaking responsibilities for chapter number two. Uh, next week, we will be covering chapter number three, which is vectors. Um, I will take on that um, presentation. Uh, chapter three is a little bit longer. Um, so I might, I might try and pick the most like relevant information for our hour discussion. Um, but uh, yeah, make sure you read chapter three and then make sure if you can, you know, do the exercises. And if you struggle with any of them, um, there's the uh, solutions guide. Um, so definitely uh, check that out. But if that's, if nobody has anything else to add, that's all I have. And I can't wait to see everybody next week. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Bye, guys.